grade zero in the fact that if you don't have one of the drives, it's it's da- damaged. You've got you've lost data. There's nothing you can do about it. So you will have two drives. If there are JBOD, one drive will still continue to have files on it that you can just do like standard file carving stuff, like go find all the JPEGs and copy them off. And you'll get those. You'll lose names and you'll lose structure and stuff. And the other disk is going to have the file system and sometimes have what's called an HPA on there. So you'll have a host-protected area, and it will be the size of the two drives together. So in other words, you'll plug in. Let's say these are two 250s, and together they make 500. The first drive will have an HPA on it that will say, I am 500 gigs. So you plug in this 250-gig drive, and it says I'm 500. Well, you know right away that that's what you're dealing with, that you've got one. And you know which one you have, too, because that will be the first one. That means the second disk is dead. So you have file system, and you can probably actually at least fix the files that exist on this one disk. So that's the one thing. So HPA. So this is common practice that you actually have to use an HPA. So a host-protected area is basically that extra space that was on a disk that says, hey, I've got some utilities, or I've got some DVDs, or I've got this other stuff that's sitting out there. Its primary purpose was to make the disk smaller than it originally is, so there's this extra space. And it will report to the, to the system as it's booting, and it will actually show up. So I could take a 500-gig hard drive, and I could say, you're 40 gigs. And when I boot it, it'll actually say 40 gigs. Everything will think it's 40 gigs. It'll actually respect that content. So you're going to use that for some various things. Uh, Most of the time, when you're cloning a disk that's damaged, you can't find the exact same disk. So you don't have the exact same geometry. So this is a way that you can set it. You can use the host-protected area to physically set the size of the disk so that it matches. And you can use it in combinations with other things. So for instance... This is a NAS box. This is a C NAS box, and there's no USB port or whatever. Now, what you can see here is I had two drives. These are the there was originally a one terabyte ar- a, a, a array, whatever you want to call it here, with this particular one. So what ended up happening is I had the 500 gig that was good, and I had a 500 gig that was bad. I took a one terabyte, and I actually cloned the one terabyte. But now when I put it back in, I need the system with this custom board with whatever they did because my whole point is to make my life as easy as possible. I could probably do this in software, but why not let the hardware, if it's still functioning, do the job? So I cloned this drive in reverse using some special tools like DD Rescue to actually clone a drive in reverse. Then you set the HPA to the same size as the original drive, which you can look on the label and actually just in the software, there's a tool... There's several tools that will set HPAs. So one of them is called MHDD. So MHDD is a free boot disk. You can boot on, plug the drive into the ATA controller, and you can basically type in from the label what your size is, and it will make it that size. So I put the one terabyte drive in here, and now it's a 500 gig. And the two drives got bound back together again in the RAID array, and I was able to actually copy the stuff off physically without having to do any other work. So make sure that you're paying attention to things like that. If you're dealing with ZFS and XFS, which will all come after the fact, like if you've repaired a RAID 0 or RAID 5, you may still have XFS or something to deal with. There's really only two ways that I know of right now that you can actually deal with. There's one that's called Test Disk, which is basically for repairing partitions, and they've added XFS support to it. Uh, They currently, I do not think, have ZFS, but he adds things all the time. So uh, Test Disk is your one way to actually say, read all the files, repair partition structure, write it back. So keep Test Disk in mind. The other one is a commercial product, which is slightly more than $100. Uh, It's called UFS Explorer, and it does XFS, and there's a current version that actually supports ZFS. So it's one of the only ones I know of doing ZFS. So as you start running into new RAID arrays that have ZFS, you may need something like this. Uh, and you can see right here, this was a Buffalo Terra station that we actually mounted, and we were ab- able to display and actually extract all the data after we corrected the physical problem with the disk. So that's enough of those other types. So let's talk about RAID 0. I know, Drake. Yeah. Woo-hoo. All right, so RAID 0, just real quick. Basically what you're looking at with RAID 0 is you have two or more drives, and they're bakes broken up into slice sizes. Now, there's some defaults that the controller will normally do, but, you know, you tech guys, every time I go to deal with one, somebody goes, hey, wouldn't it be nice if it was 8K this week? And they go into the controller and play with the sizes, so it's almost never the standard size or whatever you were thinking it was. But most of the motherboards and stuff that are locked down, you're going to end up with standard sizes where you'll have a slice size, and it rotates between the two slice sizes with your data. If one drive is dead and you cannot repair it, you cannot physically go through the process of my previous stuff, you will not get anything worthwhile out of it. You're going to get basically like a bunch of thumbnails. You're not going to get anything that's going to be really valuable except depending on the slice size. So if you have 32K slice sizes, well, 32K is gone from every file, every other 32K. So you end up with nothing. 
So RAID 0 does not have any redundancy at all. So I try not to call it RAID 0. I try to call it AIDS. <laughs> so it is a ray that's going to suck. And suck it does, man. I'm just telling you, it's, it's terrible. So, and you try to explain this to people. They're like, oh, well, I had two drives and it was RAID. Why can't I get those back? Well, uh, you know, it's a mess. Now, here's the bad thing. You can have a RAID 0 array with more than two drives. Most people think that there's only two drives in a RAID 0, but that's not true. You could go up to, like, I've had arrays in that had 14 drives in them. Now, now you're talking just crazy talk, because, I mean, it's like, it's... Now you, you don't have an order to the drives. You don't know the order of the drives. There's no signature written in most cases. You have to go through a process of guessing or looking for data that you might be able to guess in order. And, uh, yeah, that is those, for some reason, photographers, they don't get this. They're like, oh, look, I've got a Mac, and I can do software raids, so I've got six drives hanging off a USB over here. On If you're not backing up, it's over. It's game over. So... So you can usually figure out which drive is the first drive. So if you have two drives, yes, you can figure out pretty quickly. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how many drives you have. In most cases, you can figure out what the first drive is. It's the rest of the drives that you have a problem with. Because most of the time, you're going to end up, because the majority of the drives, you're still looking at like NTFS or something. Uh, if you've got Linux or something, you've got other things to deal with. But you usually have an MBR. So at the MBR, at the beginning of the disk, is kind of going to kind of give you an idea. Hey, I'm number one. Or, you know, if you're dealing with NT or something, you'll actually have like an NTFS signature at sector 63. So you can actually figure figure out almost right away. And most software, once you've actually figured out how to repair the physical side of the disk and get it running again, even if there's some damaged sectors, they will actually tell you that this is the first disk and they'll show you a disk signature. So we can figure that out as well. So uh, so this is just kind of my, my quick steps. I have more stuff on the slides that are online, so you'll get more detail if you go and download those. But ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to mount the images, we're going to review them, we're going to look at the sizes and basically play with each one, starting with the default. We're going to scan for some pictures, then we're going to extract them, listen, you know, look at them, some MP3s, we're going to listen to them. Your goal is basically to look at something like this. If you know nothing else about the drive, you're going to start with slice sizes. So you have a variation of slice sizes that can go from 2K all the way up to 2 megs. Most of the time, I'm dealing with things that are between 5, 12, and 32K in the majority of them. The standard for most of them is around 64K. But you can have drives that I've seen several of them, especially uh, uh, the manufacturer chose some special stripe size if you bought it from somebody else and ends up being something like 512K. So you can go through the variations of looking at pictures and samples in between each of the sizes. So your goal is, while I'm processing the data, find a picture that looks like it's between 32K and 64K. Look at it and see if it looks complete, and then move on through each of the steps until you actually have rotated through them. So as you're rotating through them, you can see some things, and it starts to make sense when you've seen enough of them. So I've seen a 1,000 raids at this point, so it's like every time I look at one, I can just guess most of the time. But uh, So here's some of the samples. So <laughs> now, as convenient as it is that her head, I mean, uh, well, anyway... It's not going to be very convenient for the photographer or somebody that needs to get it back. So in this particular case, you're actually missing a stripe. So you either have a disk that's actually gone, or you're missing a big chunk of the data itself. And then you got stuff like this that's a uh, very small file. So typically, these are going to be, you know, your, your, you know, this is not, you know, I don't know why they had stick porn on their stuff, but either way, it's less than 32K, and you extract it, and it looks intact. It looks okay. There's nothing, nothing special about that. But... Here's a file that most of you should recognize, or two files that most of you should recognize. So right off the bat, you know that this is there's windows on the box, and these are the sample files. They're next to each other, and they're slice sizes that are wrong. But if you look at it, this particular one came off the drive and said it was 140K. So as you divide this up, you can start to see, hey, look, I'm looking at maybe a 64K stripe size. So you can almost tell right away if you actually have two. Now, if you had crap and it wasn't a JPEG or wasn't a BMP or something that was next to that, you would actually just get down to here, it would stop, and you just get crap from here on. So wherever it is, you're going to get crap. So we can actually use the crap to analyze things. So at the start of most of the pictures, you'll usually have a thumbnail that's stored in the picture. So you'll look at something and you'll look, because they'll still look to your software as extracting the data 